Hello, and welcome to the No Bad Questions podcast, where I try to learn in a conversational manner by sitting down with people who have interesting careers, important lessons to tell, or inspiring stories. I hope that you learn something too. If you want to support the podcast, please follow or subscribe on your platform of choice. You can also like or comment to boost the algorithms or share out to your network to make sure it gets more views. But ultimately, and what I hope you choose to do, is listen to the very end. With that, we'll start today's podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the No Bad Questions podcast. I am very excited today to be joined by Dr. Navesh Kandil, MD, MBA, Fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives, who's also certified in artificial intelligence from MIT Sloan. So we've got a great background there. And part of what we'll talk about today is a bit of his career journey and how he got to that point. I will warn folks that the biggest reason I asked Navesh to come on today is to talk about a concept called hospital at home. So while I didn't design this podcast to be all around healthcare, uh, we will probably nerd out a little bit in the second half of this podcast on healthcare topics. So Navesh, thanks for being here with me. Thanks, David. I appreciate it. Look forward to our conversation today. Um, for the discretion of the audience that's listening, David and I um, had the pleasure of meeting via uh, social media at some point, but in person at Becker's uh, pre-pandemic. And it's been a fun journey. Both of us have had career trajectories that's taken us different places. And it's nice to be able to continue conversations with fellow colleagues and professionals who understand it, the challenges associated with it. And I'm really looking forward to talking to David today about hospital at home as well as anything else and anywhere else he'd like to go. So, David, thank you for this opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So, MD, so medical doctor, but I looked and pretty soon out of residency, surgical residencies, you moved into a role that at least to me looked like it was not, you know, hands-on care, still in healthcare, still, you know, making sure care is appropriate for patients. It looked like a, a level of care coordination type role. Uh, but talk to me about that because I think folks probably don't realize that there's a number, I don't want to say a lot, but there's a number of physicians out there who get done with medical school or even done with their residency or fellowship and go, I'm going down this other journey. I'm headed down a different path. So can you talk about, A, you know, why you decided to do that? What drew you away from, from hands-on patient care? And B, um, what's kept you on that pathway? Because you've stayed on that, from what I could tell, for a long time in your, your you know, illustrious career. Life in a nutshell, David, right? I'm late in the 2000s. My father, uh, late father now, unfortunately, came down with complications from long-standing diabetes and and hypertension, in, in, including dialysis and, and many other things. That towards the end of his life, he had Parkinson's and, uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's as well. And a, a moment in time came where I had to think about what's important, family and, and life mm. and, and career. And so I took some time off and stepped away from clinical practice, both domestically and where I was abroad, came home to take care of him, um, lost him in 2012. And I have my 78-year-old mother today who I take care of who has a 60-year history of asthma. So the priorities changed in life and the mm -hmm. objectives of what you wanted to do changed. The love and the passion for healthcare has never waned. And I try to bring that into every conversation and everything I do. And in fact, that'll come together with our conversation around hospital at home later. But during the journey of going through life and its cycles and being able to take care of family and friends and loved ones, the pivot to the business side of healthcare came in. Um, initially, I didn't know where it was going to lead. I didn't know what it was going to do. I, I knew that I wanted to do something different and I needed to for, for reasons that I've stated, but I also wasn't sure where it was going to take me. So right. uh, that's how it started. Um, as you said, I've stayed in it, and, and it's been a learning process and a growing process. So as much time that is spent on the clinical side of understanding healthcare, now I've spent a significant amount of time understanding the business of healthcare and the other aspects of it, which I think uh, have made me better for it all around. And I think it, it helps me in conversations like this with you and I. It helps in conversations of understanding the system better and and 
makes it sometimes easier, but it's also sometimes more frustrating because you know more. But it's right. it's a constant learning journey. So I'm, I, I, this journey for me is still ongoing, and I love it. And every day is an experience, and everything I learn in different facets of it, whether it's clinical business, uh, the technology elements of it, IT, as we say it, healthcare IT, the revenue cycle where, where, where you sit and where we, you and I first met, mm -hmm. it's understanding the whole spectrum and being able to put it all together. And mm -hmm. coming from a clinical side, that's a big challenge because our primary focus for the longest time was purely on care. And right. then the business elements come in after you leave uh, residency and then you go into practice and other elements like that and you see real life, you grow up and you're out into the world. They don't teach you those things. And that's still only one dimension of it, right? The practice and, and, the, and the RVUs and the money and all the fun stuff. But then the regulatory elements and the why, right, David? Why are right. our organizations asking us to do these things? And I think this journey, if not anything else, has taught me that there's a lot of opportunity to bridge that gap between the clinical side of the house and the financial sides of the house and the administrative side of the house because a lot gets lost in translation. Yeah. Very similar to the article that you and I talked about before we came on camera yesterday about the NPR. And when that gets lost in translation, it, it perpetuates a – unnecessary sour taste in people's mouth and we need to be able to wash that palate and, and try our best to uh, remember why we're in it we're in it because of the patients and what do we need to do to make their lives better and the patients that we take care of as well as the caregivers that take care of the patients and i think the pandemic if anything as as it should have taught us that we need to do better at both they're both yeah. hurting and you know as we get into the hospital at home and other elements, I think that'll come out. But hopefully that helps give you an idea. And, and I've got some wonderful colleagues who've crossed over, David, and I love it. And I still talk to my colleagues and friends who are in active practice. And it, it's insightful, if not anything else. And you, and you learn firsthand, right? And that's important. It's not data points in a spreadsheet or in a Tableau screen, right, or a dashboard. It's actual conversations that you don't use as all or nothing. You use it as a starting point to say, hey, if, is this something we should go forward with? And, and that's how we look at it. But fun journey. Thanks for asking that question. I've had that question posed to me a few, a few times. And I think the piggyback question that I've gotten is, do you miss it, right, the clinical side? Mm -hmm. I do and I don't. I do and I take care of a lot of friends and family from a clinical perspective and it's a navigation perspective more than it is a clinical understanding the system and the challenges yep. and, you know, but uh, it's all good. That's why we're here now. So I'm loving it. I appreciate that. And I didn't know that about your, your um, balancing the personal elements. And, and I think a lot of us reach that time and, Unfortunately, as I look ahead with the changing demographics, um, as the, you know, the, the boomer generation ages, a lot of folks in my age category are going to have to get used to uh, making that same decision and having conversations with our parents. I know uh, I'm fortunate. I, I've had the opportunity to have some of those nudges with my family and encourage them to get you know, wills and living wills and all that stuff set up. And I, I don't want to get into end of life planning or anything. I've talked about that with some other guests. I have some other ones coming up that I'm going to talk about that. But just your story is, I think, going to be more and more widespread as we see generational change coming up in society. Um, there's a, the other thing is I was going to say, um, j just comment, as I, I have talked to some colleagues who went the other, or I should say they, they boomeranged, they, they rubber banded, right? They went out of clinical and into administrative said, forget this and went back to <laughs> clinical. And uh, I, I've got at least one of those that uh, um, I'm trying to get booked and we're gonna, I'm gonna talk with soon. So, so Navesh, in, in some of what you were talking about, you know, you, you mentioned that you have some, you know, advantages having a, a doctor's, a clinical background as you get into the administrative side of it, but and I've read some opinion pieces on this that say essentially like, you know, all hospital CEOs should be a physician executive. I've got a call, uh, you know, a conversation coming up with a physician leader soon. Uh, I, I'm going to get his perspective on it, but I'm eager for your perspective as well. You've been on the business side for a long time. Do you think it's sort of mandatory for, you know, hospital and healthcare leaders to be a physician? 
Uh, great question, David. And I think that's been one of the burning questions for a lot of people in different spaces for a long time. I would say arguably from the uh, clinical side of the house, they've always argued that they would make better leaders that can run organizations. But mm -hmm. the element of this that people need to take out about it is somebody, one of my colleagues said this to me uh, some years ago, and I, I love it and I live by it. It's not about who's right. It's about what's right. Mm -hmm. So looking at it from the perspective of saying, should it be an administrator versus a clinical leader should be put that aside and say, who's the best person for this, who right. understands the needs of both the clinical element of care delivery for which you are standing up a facility, whether it's a hospital or a clinic or anything in between, versus whether it's the administrative side of managing that mm -hmm. and recognizing that. And so simple thing, like somebody said to me the other day, it's like um, his mother is the CEO, the CFO, the COO of her household. Right. So, you know, a lot of husbands or dads may not understand that element of it or parents who don't recognize like what what mothers have to do or otherwise or whether it's sometimes fathers too, right? Raising right. children, putting them to school, go to work, balance a life, balance a household. So understanding all those elements takes time and experience. Similarly in a healthcare setting, as complex as it is, clinicians are really good at the clinical elements of their job. The mm -hmm. need for being astute and knowledgeable about the business elements of it is equally important. But I don't think that that's something that needs to be done on a regular basis without um, or thought of in a regular sense of why are we doing it or should should somebody be here? Um, I think it's more about the, the approach to this is wrong in terms of we shouldn't be looking at it as one or the other. We should be looking at it as what's best for the, um, the, the patients and the organizations we serve. And, and David, I struggle with that because during this journey of 10 years of my own personal journey and talking to friends and colleagues in the industry, we all learn from our situations and right. no situation is perfect. So I think where we need to look at it is saying, what are we trying to solve for? And what are we trying to fix? Or what are we trying mm -hmm. to make better? And how do we put the best foot forward for that? So the same selection process that you would use to hire a physician or an administrator, qualifications or otherwise, should be applied to whoever that role is. Mm -hmm. If it is an administrator, great. I think the broader question that's not being asked or being understood is, the change management element of the role of one or the other, right? So mm. an administrator who's not familiar with the day-to-day -day workings of a health system outside of the fact that they know that it is run, the surgeons run the OR, the hospitalists and or the primary care physicians or specialists run the clinics and the patient floors, that's the process. But right. the actual day-to-day -day life, what that involves, the intent of the real interaction between the provider and the patient, what does that mean? I, I think those are some of the blind spots that administrators have because that's not their primary purview or their primary responsibility. The responsibility is to oversee it but not deliver it. They have right. people. At the same time, for a physician, the limitation is I don't understand the business. I don't understand why he wants to limit my block time. I don't understand why he wants me to wait, work seven on seven off or 10 on 10 off as a hospitalist. I don't right. understand why my ED doesn't have a diversion program so that I'm not lining my halls with patients that I can't serve because it's dangerous. Right. So there are elements of this that are lost in translation. And when I say change management, I think part of that means involvement of conversations, what you're doing and why you're doing it. You're not doing a good enough job of communicating to clinical leaders or vice versa, the reasons behind the decisions that are being made. And I'm saying all of this for a very specific reason because it ties back to your question, David, who's the best person for it? So if you right. ask somebody who's out of med school or outside of residency and they've practiced for 10, 15 years, I'm fairly confident to say that they don't understand the administrative elements of the business. And 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 at the same time, the clinicians, I mean, the, the administrative side doesn't either. So how do you come up with a model that you achieve both, keeping in mind it's about neither of them, it's about the patient. Right. Yeah, the patient. And uh, I, I would maybe, it's probably debatable, but I would layer on if you're a not-for-profit hospital, the community, 
because you're supposed to, by virtue of that tax exempt status, you're supposed to be benefiting your community as well. So you have to, and that's a tough balance, individual patients versus the community as a whole sometimes. But I, I would add that that layer on as well. Agreed. And I, I think that's, <laughs> it's funny you bring that up sadly, because there was a New York Times article a couple of weeks ago that talked about that, the service to the community and in, in the Virginia area, one of the health systems uh, got into trouble with the 340B program and somebody out West got into trouble with um, their charity programs and their understanding yep. of what they're supposed to do with it. And I, I think what we're all in agreement for is that, yes, you can use cliche phrases like sick care versus health care mm-hmm. to call all sorts of different things. The reality of it is um, in, in many ways, for in a sad way, um, healthcare has become purely or extensively about business. And I think that's where the rub comes in. And that's where I think the, element that people say it should be physician led is coming from yeah. because it's going back to the roots of what it was designed for. And I, 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 and that's why I'm saying I don't agree with that notion. I think we need to do a better job of getting back to why we're doing it in the first place. And, and, and the social awareness element, David, whether it's media, whether it's social media, whether it's newspaper, whatever that is, is so much more prevalent today and pronounced. Mm-hmm. I think organizations have a responsibility to recognize that everything and anything is visible to the public. And therefore, they need to be more responsible about how they handle their business, keeping in mind, eventually, you could be on the front page of a newspaper for good things or bad things. And, and how do you navigate that? Because at the end of the day, your patients are the sole reason you exist. Right. And if you can't win or earn their trust in a satisfactory manner on a consistent basis, then I I think that sort of goes away from the actual vision and the mission of most organizations. And you can say a lot of things, but actions speak louder than words. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm glad you took us there because I was going to ask about the balance between uh, care, care delivery and, and the business, because I do think that, that certainly from folks outside our healthcare industry, there's the perception that the business is taking over. And I think from some folks inside, and, and to me, that relates to, um, I think, is one of the drivers, amongst many, of physician burnout. And so the, the last kind of thing I wanted to ask you in this sort of the, the career background section is, if burnout maybe drives more docs out of care and into either just other industries or into to non-direct care roles. Um, in other words, if more people sort of follow your pathway for burnout or other reasons, do you think that will create sort of a cascading loop and drive more burnout, right? Because then your your shortages get worse. You don't have as many docs. You don't have to take more shifts, you, you know, whatever. Do you think that would be a... a self-reinforcing negative loop? um, I'm pausing on that because I think even if they get burned out and they come into the business side of it, coming into the business side burned out is not a good thing either because being burnt out requires you to just step away and take a pause and reflect on what's important for you. So if you're walking away because the money's not right and you want to jump on the bandwagon that if I become a traveler per se, so for the Mm -hmm. sake of discussion, the argument might be, okay, I might, if I'm working this many hours, I might as well get paid for it. That's one element of it. Right. But if you're truly walking away because of the moral injury slash burnout that's being caused, then I don't think it's healthy for those individuals to step back into anything until they take care of themselves. Mm. Eventually, once that's resolved, David, um, I think their contribution may be more pronounced in a positive way than people realize for two reasons. One, they see things from the perspective of the lens of somebody who has done it, seen at the root of why the pain was caused or the injury is caused or the burnout was caused, and potentially be able to give feedback on how to better fix that. But the challenge comes in in that if the vendors of the world or the administrators of the world don't listen to the actual people that are taking care of the patients you serve, which is, I mean, I find that really ironic in many ways, right, the mm-hmm. largest uh, financial bucket for most organizations is their human capital. It's their physicians right. their nurses, and their staff. You invest so much in them, yet you don't invest in taking care of them. And they are taking care of the sole reason you exist. 
So right. that particular <laughs> has never quite really resonated with me. But I don't think it will cause a danger to the cycle and make it worse. I think it will be better provided we make sure the reasons why they walked away. So you're not going out of walking out of a frying pan into the fire. The other element of I think that needs to happen uh, is I think the broader conversation needs to happen, David, around why are we at the point of the staffing challenges. So it's a people process technology and data issue always in my mind, right? I always look at it and say, what's the data telling us about people walking away? What age group are they? What are the reasons behind it? Let's try to understand where it comes from. If it's the human element of I'm just overworked and I don't have enough hours in a day, I'm psychologically just really beaten down because of what I'm being asked to do, more with less. Oh, there's like nurses who end up taking on way more census than they can handle way more responsibilities that they can handle. So some of it might be patient care. Some of it might be administrative slash regulatorily driven. The process element of it, David, is very basic. Why are we not pausing to ask the question, do we need to do something this way? Or just instead of just saying, let's just go do it, how long is it going to take for us to take a pause and understand why these folks are burned out, why they feel the way they feel? And if we understand the what and the who, then you can talk about the technology enablement or the risk or the challenges posed by it. Technology is an enabler at its finest. Are we yeah. investing in the right ones? Are they solving for the right problems? Are we utilizing them in the ways they should be? Or are we just substituting a process with a technology because we think it's going to solve a problem, right? And I think unless we tackle it that way, David, on the human capital element of it, and then the other element of it is, the nursing schools and the medical schools slash residency quotas that exist today, if organizations don't realize the demand is there and the supply right. isn't, the point you made, when people walk away, the great resignation to me is very sad because the great resignation outside of healthcare, you can go find another job. Right. The great resignation within healthcare isn't even in the bucket of people you described, David, which is crossing over from the clinical to the business side. It's literally walking away because they don't want to have anything to do with it anymore. Right. And uh, and that's also driving some of the conversations of your first question, or, or the first part of this question is, should a physician be the leader of an organization? I still go back to what I said. It's not about the person who you're hiring. It's about understanding what it is that they need to do to take care right. of their communities, their staff, and their own well-being in their organization. I love it. And I think there's a couple of really good points in there in particular about the idea that, you know, burnout is beyond, I need a new job. So just going to a different job in a different area of the industry is not necessarily, or perhaps even likely to solve the cause of burnout because there's, there's many headaches. I, you know, I live on the administrative side. So do you, there's many headaches on the administrative side too. Um, different ones, I'm sure. They're there, and so you're, you're not going to get away from the headaches just by going to the administrator. And in episode eight, I talked to a hospital COO, and I asked him, I said, so you're not just sitting in your office with your feet up on the desk, you know, <laughs> smoking a cigar and, you know, doing all the stuff that we see in, uh, in in the TV shows about the evil administrators? I said, no, you know, and, and so I think that is a, uh, a misnomer. But I think your points about listening – are valid. Not all leaders in, in any industry, but we're in healthcare, so we'll stick on that. Listen well to frontline staff. I think there's some companies that do that. Toyota comes to mind. They're pretty good. I mean, they invented lean, um, which is a lot of focus on listening to staff, but I think those companies are rare, and, and I'm sure that those hospital organizations are rare. So, no, great perspectives. I appreciate it. And so let's turn now to the healthcare nerdy part of the, the <laughs> conversation. It's if, if the career profile and healthcare leadership wasn't nerdy enough for folks, let's talk hospital at home, because I think this could be uh, transformational, but I don't know a lot about it. It could help with some of the stuff that we've been talking about, but let's start simple. What is hospital at home? Great question, David. Um, I think that's probably one of the most fundamental things that needs to be addressed in terms of definitions because nomenclature gets everybody into trouble. So because different people have different perceptions and understandings of what a hospital at home model is versus home health versus sniff at home versus acute versus chronic. So in the definition that we, what I hope to discuss with you today and talk to you about is the 
management of patients in an acute setting in their home. So it's, it's an acute model. Um, the reason why we look at it this way, or the reason why many programs have looked at it this way, successful ones, Johns Hopkins, Mayo, Intermountain, Mount Sinai, is recognizing the ability to take care of a certain population of patients that have an acute illness that don't require a hospitalization safely in their home environment to be able to manage that for the purposes of care delivery, first and foremost, but in a setting that is acceptable and suitable, primarily for the clinical condition, but also for the patient satisfaction that comes with it and the elements that come with it. And, and as we go through this conversation, I'll break that down further in terms of what that means. So it's a can zero you, to 30 day type of period is what we're looking at, sorry. Okay, no, I was gonna say, can you break down for, for non-healthcare folks that might be sticking with us, how do we define acute, right? Because some folks may not be familiar with that nomenclature. Absolutely. So an acute, they've come up with different definitions in terms of conditions. The acuity we think about is we're not expected to have somebody who just got into a terrible car accident to be sent home to be managed at home, right? We don't mm -hmm. expect somebody who comes in with chest pain that we're trying to rule out, whether it's a pulmonary embolus or a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, that we're going to send you home, right? There's a certain mm -hmm. element of patients that we know that will never come home for care. And mm -hmm. based off of that model, we make sure that when we recognize that the hospital at home models are a combination of two things, understanding the limitations of a home and, and understanding what care needs to be in a hospital and what care can be managed somewhere else, and making sure that when we consider this as an option, we make sure, for example, the provider is on board, that they understand that we are providing something that's safe at home for the patient, that the we are asking them to entrust a system that is non-traditional mm -hmm. in a, a patient's home. And equally, we also have to make sure the patients are comfortable doing that. Because some patients may say, no, I do not want to be at home. I, you have no idea what my home is like. You have no <laughs> idea, say, but I want to be in a home the hospital because I believe the hospital is the best thing that can take care of me. So right. again, going back to the change element of it is we are coming up with a different model, but we have to remember the primary stakeholder in this model is the patient. Right. and caregivers that will choose to provide this level of care at home with them. And if those those participants or stakeholders are not bought in for the right reasons and we don't do our homework well, programs will fail. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's similar to stories around ASCs and EDs and urgent cares and everything in between. Why were they set up more fiscally driven than not? We get that. Right. But are they serving the purpose that they should? And what is the intent we're trying to get out of this? And I will dare say, David, for the first time in a long time, if this model is looked at well by the organizations that look at it, it doesn't have to be a finite journey of care. It does not have to be looked at as a model saying, okay, we have a hospital at home program. It, it, can, it can be looked at as a better way to engage community, patients. It is a better way to have continuity of care because you're now in the home you right. can start looking at it from a chronic care management perspective. About 70 to 80% of what goes on in a patient's life is probably what led them to be in the hospital in the first place. Right. But when a doctor or a nurse practitioner or a PA or a nurse sees them in the hospital, they get a snapshot of what went wrong, the acuity of the illness, why they're there, right? So the factors that influence that, social determinants, where they live, what kind of food they have in their kitchen or their in their refrigerator, their abilities to cook, transportation, every element of it is not visible to us. So right. we limit our ability to take care of a patient well based off that single interaction. If we look at a hospital at home model, David, we are now in their home. We now have the ability to look at some of those things. So the reasons that may have led to recurrent visits so for the public that's asking, as you asked me earlier, acute versus non-acute, so somebody who has an asthma flare-up, as a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease exacerbation, if they have a house that is dirty or they have a house that they have pets in or their kids have pets in right. or they live next to a construction site or they have windows that haven't been cleaned or other reasons or they, they various factors, how are we going to know that in a visit in right. an office? You're not. Even in a virtual visit that we're doing today, we're not going to have full visibility to that household. So what I'm trying to get at is you're pivoting away from purely just a hospital at home 
to looking at that chronic care management. And if you're able to manage them better in their home and their domicile and get a better understanding of their limitations, you put yourself in a better position to manage their condition, the cost of the care, and their overall well-being in a better way than you were before you started the story. So if the organizations choose to participate in that way, you limit the exposures or the potential exposure, the potential hospitalizations or, or doctor's visits, and you have a more proactive approach to it as opposed to the reactive approach to it, David. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get into this more as we go on because this is critically important for a health system to look at it from a value-based perspective, but also the landscape of the shift away from the health system for primary care and ambulatory and going to the one medical Amazon model and the CVS uh, and the Walmart models. Yeah. And how do you use this as potentially a way to create a story to keep David and Navacious patients in our health system and not go to these acute systems when they have a problem? Yeah. Yeah. I, there's so much in there. Um, <laughs> three or four questions I want to ask about. Um, I, I think let me come back to your last point, but let me start with your last point about the, the innovation. But let me let me start with you, you mentioned about safety because, uh, you know, I, I think when I think of healthcare in the home, most people's gut reaction is that the hospital is going to be cleaner and safer than the home. But if you need disabuse of that notion, you should go listen to episode four of No Bad Questions uh, with Dr. Hooker, who talks about, you know, infection rates in hospitals, cleaning, you know, and so forth. So can you speak to, um, I mean, I'm sure, as you said, some homes maybe are the exception to that. Some hospitals are probably the exception to that. But can you talk about, are there any stats out there yet? I mean, this is a pretty new concept. Are there stats out there yet about you know, infection rates in home versus infection rates in the hospital? Like, is it safer at home? Um, I don't know of any stats to that effect, but I would look at it from the perspective of if the statistics did not support it, it would behoove an organization to not stand up a program and send somebody home for the simple fact that they're exposing their patients to risk and by proxy their organization to risk for, for setting themselves up for failure, right, number right. one. One of the other elements you need to look at when we talk about safety and infection is the fact that we're just not saying, hey, David, you want to go home? We can take care of your asthma um, exacerbation at home. It's also oh, making okay. sure that the <laughs> home, yeah, right? It's making sure that the home that you live in is suitable for that level of mm -hmm. care. It's doing the survey, making sure the equipment or necessary access to the home is appropriate for you as a patient, but also for these caregivers that we're looking at that need to visit you at the home. So whether it's nurses or whether it's doctors or whether it's other elements, the notion of being at home is great. But if the environment is not safe or the elements that are required, not to the direct care elements as well as the indirect care elements are not there and you're not taking into consideration, then it's a moot point. And therefore, those are prerequisites that have to be met before the, that can. So it's, it's understanding the safety and the other elements that we're talking about, but there's also the technology element of it, David, right? So as mm -hmm. important as the safety is, the technology is important because we're going to be looking at it from, to a degree, remote patient monitoring. And right. depending on chronic care management, that's going to come in play. If you do not live in an area that has a uh, robust Internet supply, like our conversation earlier today, mine apparently isn't. That's why <laughs> mine dropped, right? But it's just like if you don't have that in the neighborhood or the household, how, do you, can, how you, can you consistently make sure that you're able to utilize the technology that's required to take care of somebody at home? Do they have the technology limitations in their neighborhood, their home, or otherwise? Do they have the technology savvy? Are they technology savvy enough to be able to understand these things? Do they have friends and family that can help them with that? So there's a lot of elements that go into this, but and therefore the notion of, hey, we're going to send somebody home, isn't as black and white as people think it is. And there's a lot of thought that has gone into this. There's a lot of work that has gone into it. That's just the basic elements. Then there's regulatory, there's finance, clinical, you know, how is this any different, you may ask, than being in a hospital? Um, that's what drives this, right? I, I, I try to describe this to folks as saying, when a patient comes into a hospital for an acute visit that cannot be managed at home, once they are in the hospital, they have very few things to think about. Right. Food is brought to them. Medications are brought to them. They're taken for the tests or the tests are brought to them. They have very few places to go. People come to them. 
right? right? And low autonomy. It, <laughs> right? Yep. Once you go home, what we're not thinking about, which is now a risk, is the same things. All of a sudden, a doctor or a nurse has to visit you at the home. All of a sudden, you have to be worried about, what am, when am I going to be able to go back to work? Mm -hmm. I don't have enough money to go pick up these medications. I don't right. have a car to pick up these medications. I'll get it after work. Oh, wait, it's three times a day, and I'm going to get it three days after I was supposed to pick it up. Mm -hmm. And then, so those elements have to come into the mix to be able to understand the success or failure of this program. Therein, the program by itself is never going to be successful if you don't take these elements into account. But at the same time, if you ask any patient, by and large, would you prefer to be in the hospital or would you prefer to be at home for a minor non-acute or borderline acute condition, they would prefer to be in their home setting. I mean, yeah. they just if, if, if it can be. I mean, yeah. of course, if it's something, as we said earlier, it's life-threatening or consciously requires the care of a facility, then it's an easy decision. You don't put them in their home. Right. And, and you mentioned there about, like, doctors or nurses or other caregivers coming to the home. So that was one of the things I've wondered about hospital at home is, you know, we, we talked earlier in sort of your career profile section about burnout and sh physician shortage and, and nurse shortage. It, my head can't get wrapped around like how the staffing model for this works. Cause to me, it would need more nurses than care in the hospital. Am I wrong? Am I, help me get my head around it. Sure. So if you look at it like a shared service model to say, suppose you have 20 beds that you can deliver at, at a home. So you have 20 different patients that you could have as a hospital at home model. You, the, the nurses aren't there 24 seven. They're there mm -hmm. for periods of time that come and visit. Doctors come and visit. It can be virtual, it can be real, either or the caregivers, the different levels of care that you require. But they're going from appointment to appointment, very similar to a home health model or otherwise, where a visiting nurse service comes in and does things. So you can set up medications for a period of time. You can work with the family and talk about it if there's no family member. Sort of like saying, what's your first level, second level, third level tier of people for responsibilities? The patient by themselves. Uh, does David have family that can support us in this journey? And how do you set up those models to be able to deliver the care? The staffing model, I would argue, is actually better because you're – you can repurpose some of your staff too. When you mm -hmm. think about it, you can have staff that, to your point earlier, if the moral injury burnout has occurred and they need a change of pace, this becomes something where they have breaks in between because they're not constantly on the floor looking at five to seven patients and mm -hmm. worrying about what time somebody's meds are supposed to be or what time somebody's supposed to go to CAT scan or the OR and everything in between. And before you know it, they come in at 6.30 and it's already 8 o'clock and they're not at home yet, right? Right. You're giving them a different flavor for care in a different setting. And within that, it gives them opportunities to look at it differently and ask, is this the pivot that I wanna to go to? The other thing you gotta think about, David, is, is that health systems struggle with bed numbers today because of the staffing model you talked about, right? If you don't have enough people. If you are able to distribute this labor across the board, you have more beds to be able to support it because they're not doing it 24 seven. Mm -hmm. So you can create 20 beds at home. You have respiratory therapists. If it's a COPD patient and they're working in a hospital, you could actually say, okay, the hospital is either saturated or there's not enough cases. I'm going to take a pool of them and say, let's send them out to the homes to check on the patients to set up CPAP machines or, or otherwise and mm -hmm. take, to go, go to the home and check on them and see what they're doing. If it's traits at home, et cetera, et cetera. So people need to be creative about thinking of the model because ultimately the focus here is primary. How do we take care of them safely in the home without keeping them in the hospital, which, as your previous guest that you said in episode four talked about, the risks of being on a hospital are not light. Every right. element, of it, we, we joke about it facetiously saying, get out of the hospital as soon as you can, because the longer you stay there, you're probably going to catch something. So, so anecdotally, yeah, it's safer at home, but again, it has to meet certain criteria and elements about it. Um, ultimately, I think... The, the staffing model is less of a concern. It's actually, an, in my book, an upside and, a, and an easier way to look at it. Say you can repurpose your staff and you can create beds that you didn't have before. But at the same time, you also have to look at it and say, what is the primary focus here? The primary focus mm -hmm. is to get the patient better faster, but do not think of it as a one-dimensional hospital at home play. Mm -hmm. Think of it as saying, if I take care of that patient well in the hospital, 
What have I learned? I mean, at home, what have I learned in the management of their care at home that I can take reverse back into the health system and learn from? Mm. That's the vertical trajectory. The horizontal trajectory is if they go to a skilled nursing facility type model or if they stay at home, how do you manage that chronic care picture? How do you continue the remote patient monitoring to go from the acute stage to the subacute stage? So imagine a patient who was in a, had a heart attack in the hospital and had a bypass. They started in an ICU, then they go down to a step-down floor, then they go down to a regular floor, and then hopefully they go home to a nursing facility, skilled or otherwise, or home. That's right. similar to the care at home. So if we now have visibility to that, David, in their home, we may now be able to learn what caused it in the first place mm. and how we can prevent it better in the long run. Going back to that Amazon One medical model, that we and right. we're going back to the staffing piece of this, right? Once we learn better how this patient is managed in their home, and we can help them with the from an RPM perspective or a chronic care perspective, the goal should be they stay within their health system for care. Now they're better, they're managed better, they like their organization because it takes care of them. They don't have an acute episode, and if it happens, you're watching it, right. as opposed to a EMS coming and taking them to the closest facility, or the patient having a bad experience and saying, you know what, I don't want to be here anymore. I'm going to tell everybody and their uncle, don't go to that hospital. Just go down to the urgent care that's run by one medical down the street because Amazon delivers my parcels faster than these people can see me in the clinic. Right, right. And all right, so you, you just keep peeling back layers of the onion, which is fine. I imagine we'll run out of time before we run out of stuff to talk about on, on this topic. But so you mentioned that there's similarities to home health. How is it? What makes it different than home health? The acuity of it, right? The okay. acute nature of the, the, the... But it's interesting because due to the waiver and the licensing that's in place right now, the way that it's structured because of the public health emergency, you can... Any condition is being paid for in an acute manner. But hmm. if you think about this logically, right, and you're on a home health license and you can get paid for a, an acute visit, eventually a payer is going to knock up and say, okay, so... If this is an acute visit and you're treating it like a home health model, which is outpatient, then why am I paying you inpatient rates? I'm going to start paying you outpatient rates. So when the public health emergency goes away, that's going to be where the rubber meets the road. Sure. And there was a bill introduced into Congress. I was talking to a buddy of mine who was nice enough to share this with me because he and I talk about this a lot and we go through this. We're waiting for the CBO to determine what the percentage of savings could be if if the, if the hospital at home programs are actually full on and they were allowed to be there. Currently mm-hmm. people are looking at it as a, let's make some money game, in my opinion. Yeah. They're, they're looking at it saying it's an inpatient model, let's get onto it, latch onto it. They're looking at it as a short-sighted way to be able to generate revenue, which I see and I understand. The long game should be what, what, what I shared with you around the vertical view and the horizontal right. view. Right. Because if you're not looking at it that way, David, then it's commoditization at its at its worst, worst of both your patient, and it goes back to that ugly topic of burnout slash moral injury to the providers because you're looking at it in the same way that got you here in the first place. Mm-hmm. And and this is where payers are forcing the issue because a lot of pay providers are coming in, a lot of organizations are looking at hospital and home models because it fits the value-based care model. It fits right. the model of what a payer wants. I want to generate revenue from their premiums, but I want them to be healthy because if they stay healthy, the cost of care goes down, and by proxy, that means they are better. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. I don't have a problem with that. I think that's that's the way it should be. The one thing I will say, and this is important because I think as a society, we need to be better at this, David. We're looking at models. We're looking at physicians. We're looking at administrators. At some point, as a society, there has to be a social responsibility element as an individual. Mm-hmm. I can't keep saying, just think about this, right? If you own a car, if you own a house, you're required to maintain insurance on those elements. If you drive poorly, there are consequences. Right. Some of them may have legal ramifications. Some of them may have insurance ramifications. Healthcare is unique in that way that we allow people to do whatever they want, but they always know they can go get care. Yep. So there's a limitation to their understanding of the risk that it poses to them individually, but also the stress that it causes to the industry, the people that deliver the care, the cost of care. And I think we as a society need to do a better job of understanding that accountability factor that needs to go into it. I, you know, unfortunately know people that 
look at it and say, oh, I'm just going to go to the doctor and get another pill. And when you have that out, there's really no reason for people to do better. Yeah. And what we're doing and talking about, David, it doesn't matter what the model is at the end of the day if they don't have a desire to get better. Yeah. Yeah. And or an incentive to or otherwise. Sorry. No, no, you're you're fine. I, I think that's very true. I read a, I, I read an article recently, recently being, you know, because we're recording this in late September, so recently mid-September. Um, it was something around the stats on on an estimation of you know what what percentage of ailments healthcare ailments causes of death are essentially social diseases meaning you you we eat too much we eat bad food we don't exercise we smoke we uh undertake risky behaviors and it was, I think it was something like 70%. So to your point about the, the responsibility portion of that, I think that you're, you're spot on. I mean, cause if it's 70%, imagine what a 5% swing could do, you know, just getting it to 65, right? I mean, that's, you're talking probably a major societal shift, just moving the needle that much. I'm not talking about get rid of it because that I think it's just human nature in a prosperous society that there's, there's too much availability of too many unhealthy things. And I don't <laughs> want to take that away. I don't want to take the freedom away. If you want to, you know, ha have a two liter of soda every day, that's on you. I, I, I don't want to live that way. Um, but I don't have the right to tell you how to live. But I think that I think you're right. I think there's an element here of we need to recognize um, we as a society that you can't just go take the pill. You can't just, uh, you know, wish it away, you, you know, and, and at least not if you want to live your best life, as the cliche goes, and to have the system there to support you. Because I think that we're, we have continuing challenges. Let, let, speaking of model, let me let me zoom out, way out, and get in the time machine for a second. You talked about the benefits of seeing into the home environment. I know I've heard Dr. Atul Gawande speak about that and some some pilot programs and things like that that were done. I have heard other folks talk about how important it is uh, and some some upside of telehealth during the pandemic was the ability to see the home environment. Do you think that primary care went wrong in America when we moved away from the physician home visit, you know, what, 70 years ago or whatever? Is that where it all went wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I think it went wrong in a lot of places. That's one of them. And I, that's funny you bring that up because I think that's coming full circle all over again. Mm -hmm. Because when you think about the different models of care that are out there, whether it's that model versus the concierge medicine, you're making more personalized because you're making it more about the individual. I think the element of the delivery model is only as good as the individual's participation in their care and their well-being. Mm -hmm. So to your point, if they choose not to do it, then we're, 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 we're on a treadmill for all elements or, you know, we're on a wheel and it's going in circles. And some elements of our society from the business side of it, of healthcare, or the vendor side of it, to arguably look at it as that and say, okay, if people aren't going to do it anywhere, that means somebody's going to benefit from this in some way, so let's keep doing it. Right. The challenge for the clinical side of the house, as we see it, is that's not what we signed up for. We signed up to do better and do try to help our patients get better. Mm -hmm. The risk that individuals' choices of responsibility to, to participate or not, coupled with regulatory, financial, bad technology, poor process, um, arguably fiscal greed, sets up for a combination of bad things. Number one, you're looking at the two most basic elements of this paradigm that you require, the patient and the, and the caregivers, physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, in a commoditized manner. Mm -hmm. And the second we have allowed that to happen, David, we've shifted away from the value of what we're trying to do. So when people say value-based care, I laugh a lot at the times because, to me, that's the bare minimum. 
Mm -hmm. objective for every physician that goes into this or nurse practitioner or PA that's gone into it has always been we want to deliver the best care with the best outcome. Sure. And the money part of it is a business element of it. We're not looking. We're not trying to spend, oh, let me go find the most expensive drug because that's going to give me the best out. No. Right. The objective is to get somebody better. So when you use phrases and, and people do this, you've already you've already damaged the model. Mm. And and that therein lies part of the problem. And this is this is a, a this is not something that's going to get fixed overnight. And as a society, we got a lot of things to do. I, I personally feel that uh, we've come a long way, but the pandemic has shown us and brought to the forefront things that people have been talking about for 20 years. Yep. Burnout and and um, moral injury have been going on for a long, long time, yep. David. The, the 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 and it's now coming to the forefront and. The reaction to these problems scares me because mm -hmm. the reaction to the problems as I'm seeing it are in two buckets. Let's throw bodies and money at it. Oh, wait, we need to make sure that we hit our numbers because if we don't hit our numbers and our and our margins aren't where they need to be, we'll be like a football team. And I look at I really look at healthcare systems like like sports teams and the sports teams leadership. It's what have you done for me lately? Right. If you're winning, you stay. If you're not, you're gone. Right. And everything has been, and we've, and that's, that, that we're, we're on a dangerous pathway if we don't, we, we don't fix it in a better way. And, and because we've talked about the models, we've talked about the people. The models don't exist if you don't have the people. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. And nothing good can come from, adding more work to people or having people who are not qualified doing the work or doing things or cutting corners to get to where you need to get. I, I think there's a lot of promise. There's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of value. I think there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of um, things to look forward to for the right reasons. But I really think that um, a, a coming together of the clinical and the business sides of the world, consistency from the payers and CMS Getting on the same page, recognizing we're all going towards that cliff together. Right. That's the part nobody's understanding, right? People think that, oh, I'm not going to hit that. No, oh, we're all headed there. Yeah. We all, we're all in this together. We're going to sink or we're going to swim. The iceberg is ahead of the Titanic. We should turn, to, <laughs> yeah. you know. Very well put. And then, and it's, and it, that's where that, it, this isn't about this. This isn't about whose fault is it anymore. It's like looking at it as an opportunity to do better and be better. And that's why this, when we, you asked me to speak about hospital at home, to me, it's a wonderful model to achieve what you want to achieve. You're giving your patients an ability to have an alternative place of care. You're giving your organization to deliver care in a home setting. You're giving your organization to focus on patients that fit a profile that get sick frequently or cost money to take care of frequently and don't get better. Mm -hmm. You're looking at it from a preventative nature, and you're pushing away potentially new entrants to the market, such as Amazon and others, and keeping them at bay because you're having that continuity of care and that care continuum, which, which will help you grow your organization and grow your community value. And let me let me let me jump in on that one because that that was one you talked innovation earlier. You mentioned about keeping some of these other entities at bay, if you will, out of healthcare. And some folks may think that's good and some folks may think that's bad, but do you think, and, and do you think that the adoption and the drivers of the innovation in hospital at home are gonna come from existing hospitals or is it going to come or does it need to come from, you know, disruptors for lack of a better buzzword? I think it's a combination of both, right? Mm -hmm. The necessity is going to be driven by the entrance of the disruptors and the accelerated pace at which they're trying to play. So when CVS purchased Signify and Amazon purchased One Medical, you're looking at the primary care element of it, and then you're looking at the primary care and the cont continuity of care element of it. The disruptors are accelerating the models and the land grabs of getting patients. They're basically on the objective of saying, hey, guess what, David? You as a health system, 
you'll be go you'll be where I send my patients to go for a cabbage, hip replacement, knee replacement, all those acute things. God mm-hmm. forbid they have car accidents. That's what you're going to be for. Everything else in between, we're going to take care of them. Right. And we're going to manage the care of them. The disruptors are going to drive more than anything else the need to evolve for organizations and partner with the right entities. Well, I hope they do, and I'm starting to see them to do that way because mm-hmm. it is, it's at a, at a, in a sad way, survival of the, of the fittest. Right. If a health system does not recognize, David, the ability or the, the risk that having those new entrants in the market will do to them, it, it goes down to basics, right? What are the – any conversation that I've been in in the last six months with any organization, priorities have been very straightforward. Digital front door and patient access. Mm-hmm. So if we talk about digital front door and patient access and we talk about those disruptors we talked about, they got that covered. Right. They have that covered, right? And they have it covered really well. Right. So why would I come to you if I can get an appointment faster, quicker, easier, with a better outcome, not have to deal with a crappy bill and God knows how many other things I'm going to have to deal with? Because that's that instant gratification mentality that as a society we are. Yep. That's what they're tapping into. Yep. But and there's a market for that, and that's why they're they're successful in it. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, if hospitals innovate in this space, if they're the ones who innovate in this space, to your point there about m- many hospitals, survival of the fittest are going through consolidation, not necessarily by choice. Other hospitals are closing, uh, particularly small hospitals. Is hospital at home something that? fits all sized hospitals or is it only the big boys that are going to be able to play in this field? Is it only the small one? Like, what do you think? Is it, is it something that everybody, everybody meaning every hospital in the country could look at, or, you know, it doesn't work for rural um, because rurals too, you know, the, the internet connectivity problems you mentioned, the ability to get nurses to the home, you know, or the doctor to the home. What's your thoughts on fit? I think the hospital at home model will, and you answered the question partly on the back end of that, right? The nursing challenges and mm-hmm. the ability to get folks home or the technology challenges, but you also have to look at it from the acuity challenges. Are they, are they close enough to the hospital to get them to the hospital in the event something bad should happen? Oh, and I okay. think those health deserts that we talk about and those challenges, these are this is a good way to start pushing that social conversation around mm-hmm. if we know that there are parts of our country that are pockets that don't have access to care, how do we start developing that access point built around this model? And so you, if you, in to reach the prerequisites for that are saying, okay, people live in these health deserts in the middle of nowhere. They can't get access. We can get them a virtual visit through their cell phone because their cell phone carrier will carry it, but they can't get the other element of it. So now we're starting to bring to the forefront which populations, and that's a whole different conversation because we're going into an equity and, and access issue. That that's a, mm-hmm. a, a so it won't fit everyone, David. To your point, to, to to pointedly ask your question, you have to be conscious of the infrastructure that you require, the support you need from the organization in the event something bad should happen, or dangerous should happen, or unsafe should happen, or the acuity get more severe. How do you manage that? So keeping all that in mind, you have to look at it from a phased approach. Try it in larger neighborhoods, larger facilities, and then eventually, depending on the disease state and how acute versus how manageable can it be, you may be able to put it out to smaller hospitals and smaller facilities. Because, again, same challenges. What if you don't have the nurses or the ability to get out there? What if they don't have the technology? What if they can't get them back to the hospital in a timely manner if something goes south? So those are all very important. And the densities of cities and towns where those have that access makes it so much easier to manage. And as a health system, I would have to be concerned about that, too. The model looks great, but what are the limitations? Now, let me put a pause there. That's the acute hospital at home model. So if we look at the chronic care management for remote patient monitoring or otherwise, elements of those could be done because of the non-acute nature of what we're dealing with. Right. And that's where I'm saying this is the maturity model. This is where people should not look at this as a one-dimensional cash cow. They need to look at this as saying, hey, there is so much more we can do 
if we position this properly for the community. And again, to me, I think the biggest success of this will not come from the providers. I truly believe the payers will push for this because they want to drive down the cost and they've recognized the value of it. And it's already been proven by so many payers. So they did. It happens in Pennsylvania. I believe UPenn and Penn Health and one of the payers is doing it at the University of Michigan. They're involved. So mm -hmm. I think it's a combination of both sides recognizing what is the intent. Mm -hmm. The intent is to drive better quality, better, better outcomes, lower cost, quadruple aim of taking care of the providers who are taking care of them and driving down burnout. You can, this can be achieved in this model and then some. It's the choice of who wants to get into it, which is yeah. the Scott bill and who's going to pay for it. And, you know, how can I get this reimbursed, which is another five podcasts that you're going to need to. Cover sure. On. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, well, I want to thank you for educating me and any listener who hung in there about this emerging way of taking care of people. I want to thank you for your positive message about how we keep our eye on the focus and on the purpose of healthcare organizations, but also for some of your warning, you know, messages about, uh, you know, as I phrased it, the iceberg ahead. And, and so I think we had a well-rounded perspective, you know, positive, negative, potential changes, et cetera. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, Navesh, if people want to learn more, if they want to reach out to you, if they want to connect, is there a good way for them, you know, on, you know, social media, email, like, I don't know what you want to put out for the global internet to hear, but how can people get a hold of you? Oh, the LinkedIn is the best place to, I'm, you know me, I'm on that all the time. And I just tend to share articles that I feel that would benefit folks to read. I just, I mean, and it's the easiest place to find me and we can go from there. Um, David, this has been awesome. Um, I appreciate what you're doing for our healthcare community by having these interviews with different leaders and different folks and educating, um, the, the industry and those who are not in the industry. And I think that I, I want to leave you with that single element. If there's anything that we can do better as a provider and a payer based community, it's the education of the communities we serve mm -hmm. in a more holistic manner. And it's not just about medicine. It's not just about business. It's about just being more knowledgeable. Take the time to understand what it is people are talking to you about and why. And more you understand and more you can be more participatory in that. And I think if there's the, if there's room for improvement there from our part to give back to the people we serve, I think that's where the element lies. And, I, and it behooves us to do that because we can't blame them for what they're not doing if they don't understand it. So let's start walking right. with them or try to take them on that journey. We're not going to win all the time, but you got to start somewhere. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Dr. Navesh, thank you for being with me here on No Bad Questions. Thanks, David. You take care and have a great weekend. I appreciate it.